because the church goes beyond the preacher the church goes beyond the choir the church goes beyond the position the church is all about Jesus Christ this time uh, we're gonna ask sister Jocelyn to come she's gonna bless us with the selection following that will have the message and the message will lead into communion. Amen. Jesus, you're the center of my
God, we thank you for being the center of our joy. Thank you, God, for being everything that we need you to be. We thank you, God, that with all that's going on in this world, we can center our attention, our faith on you. And by doing so, we know that everything's going to be all right. In our personal lives, we center. In our occupations, God, we are centered. In our relationships, we are centered. With the calamities and the politics of the world, we are centered. And by being centered, God, you are that gravitational pull. You draw us even closer to you so that we don't have to worry and we don't have to be afraid. Thank you, God, for being that for us. You didn't have to do it. You don't have to do it, but you do it because you love us, and we want to say thank you. God, will you now bless this word as it goes forth? Bless both the speaker and the hearer. Use me, dear God, for your glory, and even while I'm sharing, speak to me, God that we all might leave with on one accord and of the same mindset that there is a cup for all of us to drink. God, we thank you in advance for the lives that will be saved, for the souls that will be encouraged. God, we give this moment to you and ask that you have your way. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. Come on. Can we bless God for Sister Jocelyn Brown? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jocelyn, for blessing us. Want to continue to lift up um, her family in our prayers as well. Recently celebrated the home going of her grandmother. And so um, we want to bless or ask God to continue to bless Jocelyn, your entire family, as you all Make your way through the grieving process as well. Amen. We all got to go through it. Um, but the good news is we're not going through it by ourselves. Jesus is with us every step of the way. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is the same scripture we read last week. Amen. I figured we'd try it one more time. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. From the New Living Translation, it reads this way. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him, him being Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request, he asked. And they replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and the other on your left. Verse 38, but Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. And then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. I want to focus in on verse 38. Let me read that again. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. And the question he asks is, are you able, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink. I'll stop right there. This morning, I want to share with you from this subject, drink what's in your cup. If you sit next to somebody, keep your mask on, but just tell them, drink what's in your cup. Some of y'all should be shouting right now. Amen. Drink what's in your cup. Last week, we shared from this same text dealing with uh, the focus and remaining and keeping focused. We discussed and examined 
how James and John lost their focus because they saw power and a seat of position. The disciples lost focus because they spent their time getting on the request of James and John and reprimanding them. But there was one in the text who didn't lose focus, and that was Jesus. And last week, and let me say it again this week, I want to encourage you that as you live life, don't lose your focus. It's so easy to get distracted by people, by things, and by even your own thoughts. But with the help of God, God can help you to keep your focus. That's what we discussed last week. But within that conversation, within that text, Jesus asked James and John a relevant and pertinent question. Jesus says, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I am, that I am about to drink? He asked them. As they say, hey, Jesus, we want to sit on your left and your right. He says, are you able to drink from my cup? And that's what I want to talk about just for a few minutes this morning. Um, drink from your own cup. Drink what's in your cup. I was younger. And whenever my family would have gatherings, my uncles would be there. And I noticed early on that what they had in their cup was different from what I had in my cup. And I don't think I was the only child that was curious about what was in their cup. And so as they'd be in conversation and, and, and having a good time and watching games or whatever, I'd make my way to their cup. Now, I had my own cup, but I was intrigued, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, with what was in their cup, because what was in their cup, what, what was in their cup didn't come from the same Coca-Cola can that I had. What they had in their cup came from a bottle that either had a cork in it, or a cap on top of it, or it came in a purple pouch. Some of y'all catch that later. And so, so with ice cubes in it, I'd make my way over to their cup, Tracy, and I'd smell the cup. I'd smell it, and it smelled different, and as soon as I would reach to grab a hold just to sip, they'd catch me. And they'd tell me, put that down. That's not for you to drink, that's my drink. And I was always curious and intrigued as to what was in their cup and what it tasted like. And I'll be honest, as soon as I was legal, yeah, I got my own cup, Ed McGrady. And I realized, here it is, I realized that they were right, that what they had in their cup wasn't made for me. We are often, often consumed with other people's cups. We are consumed about what their cups look like, and we're consumed with what they're drinking out of their cups, failing to understand that the God that we serve has given all of us a cup, and the God that we serve is calling upon us to drink out of our own cup. You're spending too much time and too much energy having conversations about what's in their cup. You are looking at their responses and their reactions based upon what they're drinking, but that's their cup. And whatever is in their cup was made for them. And God is saying, you got your own cup, and you need to drink from your own cup. William Shakespeare writes in King Henry IV, 
Uneasy is the head that wears the crown. Modern day translation, heavy is the head that wears the crown. James and John, they want the crown. They don't want Jesus' crown, but they want their own crown. They want to be seated in positions of power. They want to be recognized by others. But I hear William Shakespeare saying to us, Heavy is the head, though, that wears the crown. It's not just the crown is heavy, but it's the fact of how much you got to do to get the crown and how much you need to do to keep the crown. And we all are enamored with crowns, but oftentimes we don't know what someone had to go through or is going through to wear that crown. And Jesus parenthetically says to James and John, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to wear this crown? Are you able to drink from my cup? And just like James and John, we, we say, yes, Jesus. We can drink from your cup. Just like I said uh, to my uncles years ago, I can drink from your cup, but they knew. That if what they had in their cup got to my lips and my tongue, I wouldn't be able to handle it. I wasn't ready for it because it wasn't made for them. And Jesus wanted James and John, his disciples, and us to know that you got your own cup. And in your own time, you're going to have to drink from that cup. In the Old Testament, the cup signified a few things. In the Old Testament, the cup would sometimes symbolize joy and prosperity. But then in other times, uh, the cup represented judgment and pain. And oftentimes throughout the Old Testament, you will see God giving a cup or, 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 or the alliteration of, of the children of Israel drinking from the cup. And in some instances, that cup would be the cup of joy. That cup would be the cup of blessings. David declares, my cup runneth over. All of us want to drink from that cup. I've yet to meet a believer that doesn't want their cup overflowing. But you want it overflowing with the joy and the prosperity and the blessings. But God wants us to understand that the cup isn't always filled with joy and prosperity and blessings, sometimes in that cup, there's some things that won't feel good to you or taste good to you, but it'll grow you. I remember being home uh, just brings back and resonates so many memories. I remember at times uh, our neighbors across the street, Mrs. Stallings, whenever any of us would have a cold or the flu, we'd go to Amanda Stallings across the street, and she would make what we know as a hot toddy. Because we didn't have alcohol in our house. Wasn't no Jack Daniels in the Owens household, but Sister Stallings had a few bottles of some stuff. And when we would get sick, Grandma would say, go on over there to Mandy. That's what we called her. She got something for that. And she called Mandy and said, Dana's coming over. Fix up something. And I watched Mandy in that kitchen. And she'd have some lemon and she'd put a little honey and some other stuff in some glass containers and then that alcohol was poured in and she'd heat it up and she'd pour it in a jar, seal it and say, now you go home and you drink this and you get in the bed and go to sleep. Well, I think, I, I used to think that getting in the bed was part of the remedy, but I realized later on, no, I was going to get in the bed. She, she wanted to make sure that when you drink this, you laying down because you're going to be knocked out. Now, I hated the taste of whatever that was. But the amazing effect was that when I woke up the next morning, that which was ailing me the previous day was gone. I'm trying to help somebody understand 
that with the cup that God gives us, there will be cups of blessings and there will be cups of joy and sometimes that cup will overflow but God cannot give us a steady diet of joy and blessings because if God gives us a steady diet of joy and blessing and prosperity we will take God for granted and the cup for granted and God says every now and then I got to remove that cup because you've grown spoiled with how I'm treating you. I need to put something in you that'll grow you. Yeah, you won't like what it tastes, but you've got some sin issues in you, and I need you to drink from this cup, and that's the time we want to fuss with God. That's the time we want to look at somebody else's cup and ask the question, how come they ain't drinking it? Well, they don't have the issue that you have, but if you drink what God serves you, I guarantee in the morning, everything will be all right James and John they trying to get the crown and Jesus says but in order to get the crown you got to drink the cup can you drink the cup yes we can yeah yeah yes we can Jesus Jesus says you, you're missing it Jesus says to us we're missing it Jesus says, you, you, you partnering with me, you learning from me, you being my disciple isn't about you profiling. Isn't it about you creating some, some spiritual image? Jesus says, I'm not doing all of this for you, James, John, and disciples, and members of Messiah and those watching. I'm not doing this so that you can increase your numbers in Christianity. Your followers following you because you say, no, Jesus says, I'm doing this for a purpose. And Jesus tells them, he tells us, and if you spend enough time with me, instead of being concerned about somebody else's cup, you will learn the lesson. And Jesus says, and I will give you what you need. Yeah, you asking for seats on the right or left, but that ain't what you need. You need a heart to serve. You need a heart to give. You're trying to profile with goblets and glasses, and Jesus says, let's work on the heart first. Jesus says, get to know me first, and everything else will come. Um, there are some friends I have, and, and we hang out once a month. I won't tell you where we go. I won't tell you. It ain't nothing crazy, but we got a little spot. And one of my friends, uh, he frequents this spot more than we do. And he is on a first name basis with the bartender. And every time we go and we sit down and we eat, the bartender immediately comes and places his drink in front of him. We hadn't even ordered drinks, but he's got his drink. And I remember one time we was hanging out, and I said to him, I can't say his name. I said, listen, how do you, what? And he said, uh, you in my business now. I said, no, nah, I'm just curious because I don't know him, and he don't know what I like. He said, well, I come here often. And when I come here, I talk to him. He knows me and I know him. And when I told him my drink of preference, he makes it just the way I like it. So when he sees me, because of our relationship, I don't have to tell him what I want because I've spent enough time in his presence for him to give me what I want. Now y'all need to move away from that scene and understand that Jesus is telling James and John that if you spend enough time with me and allow me to become your spiritual mixologist, yeah, I like that, that I will give you what you need that when you show up, I'll provide you with what you need. Is there anybody here that can give God some praise that you close enough with Jesus that he gives you? You don't even have to ask for some stuff. 
but because you on a first name basis, he knows exactly what you need. I don't want somebody watching or here to be thrown off by the use of alcohol and all of this. These are just lessons that I'm learning in life. But what I've learned is this, though. It's so funny. You can't take off that hat when you come to church and then put it back on when you leave. Yeah. I'll go there for one minute because in my home church, not this church, my home church back in Ohio, we had a few of our leaders who partook of some beverages throughout the week but was holier than thou on Sunday morning. And what they didn't know is that even as they tried to hide it, it, you could smell it on the breath. And if it was too hot in the church, it would come out the pores. I'm just talking about what I realized as a kid. I'm just helping somebody understand that we all got some kind of track record. And we all know some folk who have dibbled and dabbled with different types of cups. But I guess what I'm trying to implore to you this morning is, but there is one cup that if you learn how to drink from that, you won't have to seek another bottle. You won't have to seek another liquor store. You won't have to seek another mixologist because Jesus will supply all that you need. And there's somebody here who've been addicted to some bottles, but by the grace of God, you can declare that once I had a taste of Jesus, my life was never the same. Jesus says, let me get on. So, so we all got a cup to drink. And, and Jesus says to James and John, um, you ready to drink? You able to drink? Yes, we are. He said, yes, you will drink, but it won't be the drink that I'm drinking. We, we all got a cup. Jesus says, we all got cups. And you gonna drink. Some of the ingredients in your cup will be in my cup, but God will design your cup specifically for you. I want us to understand that all of us have cups. But within our cups that God gives us, we all going to have three of the same ingredients. Let me share them with you and I'm done. The first ingredient is, is the ingredient of suffering. You're going to have to suffer. I wish that I could avoid this, but, but in this Christian journey, you're going to have to suffer. But as I, as I examined suffering throughout this week, I constantly kept realizing that when someone goes through suffering, there is growth on the other side. That, that growth and suffering was always connected. That there was always some kind of supernatural blessing, that there was always some kind of miracle on the other side of suffering. Now, I don't know why God designed it this way, but I'm realizing that when I suffer, God isn't punishing me. God isn't necessarily upset with me. God allows me to go through this suffering because God knows on the other side of this suffering, I will have a different perspective about my life and a different perspective about God. Much of what I know about God, I've learned in the Bible, but through some suffering, it has taken on a whole new meaning. When I found myself backed up against the wall, when I found myself stuck in a corner, when I was in a dead-end situation, and I found myself suffering, I thought that God was upset with me. I, got, I thought that God wasn't dealing with me any longer only to realize that God actually in the suffering was closer to me in my suffering than I imagined and God was giving me some stuff that I had to drink and God said I'm going to have you drink from this suffering I know you've been crying tears and I know you've been going through the pain and I know you don't like the process but on the other side of the suffering is growth on the other side of the suffering is enhancement on the other side of the suffering is a do you is there anybody here that can honestly say that I've gone through some suffering and I did not like it but when God brought me out I'm much stronger now in Marvin Sapp's word I'm wiser now I'm better now so much better give God some praise for the suffering we have to go through it won't always be 
It won't always be blue skies. Nope. Jesus says, in all of our drinks, we're going to have some suffering. But also, in all of our drinks, we're going to have some sacrifice. This is all. See, Jesus pays a higher price in suffering. Jesus pays a higher price in sacrifice. But Jesus says, all of us got to sacrifice. We don't want to suffer. And we don't want to sacrifice. Again, we just want the blessings. We just want the good stuff. The sacrifice. The, the sacrifice in understanding the, the background of this. The sacrifice was part of worship. <laughs> that, that, that when the people sacrificed, it was a form of worship. Sacrifice means to kill. Sacrifice means to give up. And so, so what Jesus is helping James and John and us understand is that when you sacrifice, it hurts and you give it up, but it is a form of worship. I can't tell you the last time where someone come and came and said to me that I, I, I gave a sacrificial offering and I worship. No, sacrifices hurt. To parents who are raising children, you got to sacrifice what you want to do so that you can help your child. I never heard a parent be like, oh, I'm so happy to be sacrificing all of this in my time and my life and my money for my child. No, nope. you're saying I can't wait till you turn 18 or I can't wait till you get out this house because I'm tired of sacrificing for you in our church as we're going to talk about our renovation campaign. Uh, there's going to be a sacrifice that's going to be asked of you. This sacrifice goes above and beyond what you normally do. And let me help you understand. And this sacrifice ain't a one-time thing because the sacrifice has to hurt that's the thing about a sacrifice. It has to hurt. So if we're asking for a sacrificial offering, a $1 bill ain't going to hurt you. God is saying, I want you to sacrifice that in which you have. I want you to give, but then I want you to give above and beyond. I want you to question, should I do this? I want you to question, will you make a way? But in your sacrifice, it's a form of worship. And God says, when you learn how to worship me in spirit and in truth, the, the doors of heaven and the windows of heaven will be opened up. When you learn how to sacrifice, and I'm not just talking about money, because Paul says that we've got to become a living sacrifice. Our bodies have to be sacrificed for God. I've got to sacrifice my time. I've got to sacrifice my energy. i got to sacrifice my mind to the Lord so that I might be able to give all that I have to Jesus. Is there anybody here that has sacrificed some stuff in your life? How did it feel at first? When you first sacrifice something, uh, you f you fussing and complaining, uh, and you thinking how long this sacrifice is gonna last. But the longer you sacrifice it, uh, the more you begin to see a change and a growth. I saw a video this past week uh, of a young man who had lost 60 pounds. He was on a YouTube video, uh, and he showed what he looked like, and he was a mess. Uh, and he he's talked about how he got on his workout plan, but he also said, "But I had to sacrifice." my eating habits. He said, I had to kill some of my eating habits. I, I sacrificed the fried foods. Uh, I sacrificed the desserts. Uh, and I started doing meats and vegetables. Uh, he said, and I didn't like it the first day. I didn't like it the first week. He said, and I didn't like it the second week. He said, but by the third week, I'm still not happy with it. He said, but I walked by the mirror. And when I looked in the mirror, I realized that the sacrifice that I was making at the dinner table was paying off in the mirror. All of us want to look good as believers uh, but many of us don't want to make the sacrifice to look good as believers. Uh, looking good as believers isn't showing up on a Sunday morning, isn't tuning in virtually and saying I'm a part of the worship service. No, it's sacrificing who I am. Uh, it's turning away from some stuff that I want to do because I want to please God. And Jesus says when you learn how to sacrifice 
who you are and what you are, there is a Sunday morning experience coming. I feel like doing it just for one minute because as Jesus suffers and he sacrificed his life for our life, the good news is that he died on the cross. But early Sunday morning, the same sacrifice that hope that happened on a Friday came out as a resurrection on a Sunday. If somebody can understand that when you sacrifice who you are to the Lord, God will raise you up. God will give you strength. My brothers and sisters, in our cup, we've got suffering and we've got sacrifice. And lastly, we'll close and we'll get ready to drink from our cups. We've got suffering, sacrifice, and the last is service. Don't nobody want to serve no more. We were at a restaurant with my family um, when my family Friday evening, we were at this restaurant, our wait was longer than usual. I walked around and I saw empty tables. I'm frustrated because I see empty tables, but yet we're still waiting. And I just had a word uh, with, with, with the young lady at the front. I said, let me ask you this question. There's empty tables, but we still waiting. She said, well, the problem is, we don't have enough servers. We got the food in the kitchen and the cooks are there. But the cooks weren't hired to serve. The cooks were hired to cook. They got people in the kitchen cleaning the plates. We got the dishwashers in there. The bar is open. We got the bartenders. She said, but we don't have enough people to serve. In our churches, Donovan, we got folk. They'll come and give remarks. We got folk that love to read scripture. They love to sing a solo. They love to have their name up on the screen. Yeah, we got folk that would love to spend time color coordinating. We got folk that would love to have conversations about what we should do but what we ain't doing. But the truth is, when it comes time for them to serve, you can't find nobody. Somehow serving just ain't that popular. And serving, watch this, because Jesus shows me, because serving isn't when people see you serving. No, serving takes place when don't nobody know you're serving. Serving takes place when the cameras aren't on when it's not a photo opportunity, but you helping somebody. Serving somebody means you may not even know their name, but you know their situation and you know their condition. And the truth is, I'm going back to Amanda Stallings, the truth is uh, all of us have been blessed by somebody who served us along the way. You are here because somebody that wasn't even related to you helped you along this journey. Uh, they served you in some capacity. There's some mother of the church that cooked you dinner. Uh, there's some father of the church that took care of your yard. Uh, there's somebody who helped you out when they didn't even know who you are. Jesus says you got to drink from the cup of suffering. Uh, you got to drink from the cup of sacrifice. And you got to drink from the cup of serving. You got to serve somebody if I can help somebody. As I pass along, if I can help somebody with a word or a song, then my living will not be in vain. We all got a cup to drink. I don't know all that's in your cup, but I got my own cup. But what we all going to have, we're going to have some suffering, but we're going to grow from it. We're going to sacrifice because that's part of our worship. And we're going to serve instead of looking to be served because we want to be like Jesus. On that Thursday evening, Jesus gathered with his disciples. And the scripture says he took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body. My brothers and sisters, those of you here, and those watching virtually, let's eat together. 
And then Jesus had a cup of wine. And he blessed that wine. And he shared with his disciples, take and drink. This is my blood shed for you. We take our cup and we're going to drink what's in our cup. What's in here? It is suffering. Yeah. What's in here? It is a sacrifice. It is the service that Jesus gave to humanity. And every time we drink of this, we are reminded of what he did. But also we should be reminded of what we should do and what we should be about. It's not just about first Sunday and I need my communion. It's about understanding that when I drink of this cup, there's a responsibility that's being given to me. That God is telling me, you're going to have to suffer, but I'm going to be with you because I want to grow you. You're going to have to sacrifice some things, but it's part of worship. Give it up. And you're going to have to serve. Serve your fellow brother and sister. Let's drink together. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Can we give God a hand of praise for the cup in our life? Drink what's in your cup. I like that. I like that. We're going to close with that. Keep going. It'll never lose its power. Let's sing one verse of that. To those of you watching virtually, let's sing one verse of this and we're going to close. It reaches. It reaches. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Never lose. It's power. Amen. To those of you watching, we want to thank God for you. Praise God that you've tuned into our virtual worship service. We look forward to having you join us next Sunday um, at 10 a.m. Uh, same YouTube channel. To our members who are watching, if you'd like to view our um, church meeting tomorrow evening, make sure you log in, make sure you get registered, uh, and, and, and just celebrate. We're going to celebrate what God has done. Listen, to those of you watching, you got a cup to drink. Don't be concerned about what's in somebody else's cup. You got a cup to drink, and in that cup is a cup of suffering, sacrifice, service. To God be the glory for the great things he's doing in your life. We'll see you next week. Amen. Amen. It'll never, it'll never, it'll never. It'll never.